This is Deirdre Wallenick, mother of free solo climber, Alex Honnold, and you're listening to The Soul of Life. You say I do, you get married, and you go, you and I are one. But you're thinking, I'm the one. Today on The Soul of Life, I speak with founders of Imago Relationship Therapy, Harville Hendricks and Helen LaKelly Hunt. Our deepest desire as human beings and the life you really want to live is one in which you can play with another person. Imago, which is Latin for image, is the theory that we're attracted to partners who represent a subconscious image of our early caretakers. Amago was one of the first of several innovations in the treatment of couples in therapy that grew out of the family therapy movement of the 1960s, prioritizing not just the psyche of the individual, but of the pair. We sort of moved from starting on the inside of people and working with their subjectivity to regulate anxiety and other issues and past traumas, and then be able to function better. We start with the outside, and help people function better in their interactions with each other in order to regulate all that inside stuff. Harville and Helen are three-time New York Times bestselling authors, and they were inspirational to my early career and later my very own book on the subject. They are especially known for their use of teaching couples a structured way to speak and listen to each other. It sort of turned the therapeutic process on its head. Structure creates safety, which makes it possible to experience connecting and intimacy. They teach that by approaching communication as almost a sacred channel of communion with another, you can transcend negativity, which occurs basically when selfishness takes over. When you become self-absorbed, you build a world inside your head, but you assume it's like the world outside, and it's not. They're passionate about helping people give up on the project of trying to change each other. I am so happy that I stopped trying to improve Harville. We discuss our mutual affection for the science of astrophysics and cosmology as a source of spiritual wonder and one of Harville's favorite sci-fi TV shows. I'm here to meet you, (laughs) Captain Picard. What is going on? Welcome to the Soul of Life. I'm Keith Miller, and this is episode three of season three, The Space Between. There is power when you capture the essence of it. There's power when you capture the essence of it. I just don't want Keith frustrated. You don't want Keith frustrated. I'm Keith Miller, and my podcast, The Soul of Life, is here to help you remember who you really are. I'll bring together people who have gotten off their treadmills. I'll have conversations with athletes, musicians, doctors, scientists, healers, and entrepreneurs to discuss the fascinating edges of our knowledge in neurobiology, psychology, and physics. This is The Soul of Life. Have you ever been in a position where you know that you or your family member really needs emotional support or marriage enrichment, but you find out how expensive it is to get access to high quality out of network professionals? Well, I've created the Soul of Life community just for this. At community.souloflifeshow.com, you can join for free and be part of a network of caring and supportive people having conversations that can bring healing to your soul. It's there that you'll find access to psychoeducational courses to deal with stress, anxiety, and relationship conflict. For example, right now I'm offering a seven-week immersive course for couples called Mindful Marriage that walks people through a mindfulness-based stress reduction curriculum I designed that really gives couples in conflict a map towards stability, trust, and deeper intimacy. Just go to community.souloflifeshow.com, check out the courses, and join for free to be part of the Soul of Life community of learners and soul seekers. Harville Hendricks and Helen LaKelly Hunt are the co-founders of the Imago Relationship Therapy, a paradigm-changing and pioneering model of couples therapy that started in the 1980s that helped revolutionize the way psychotherapists view couples and the nature of healing through the lens of attachment theory, the idea that, in a sense, we belong to one another and are expertly equipped to heal each other's trauma from our earliest attachments in life if we choose to have a conscious relationship. They say that conflict can be a blueprint for growth, and I'm excited to have Harville and Helen here today. How are you guys? Good to see you. We're great. Thank you. Good to see you, Keith. Yes, I... I I think you spent some time in New York, if I'm not mistaken. I know parts of the country are opening up. I know that part is. 
you know, well, we spent about 30 years in New York, but we are now residents of Dallas, Texas. We, oh, we yes. hightailed it out of there about, oh, seven years ago, something like that. Yes. We're yes. running a big project called Safe Conversations in Dallas now. And so we're Dallasites, Texans. You guys are legends in our field here. You've written over 10 books, including three that have been on the New York Times bestsellers list for I don't know how long. Um, Harville, you've been on uh, the Oprah show back in its heyday 17 times. I think that was a real game changer for your getting your work out there. Yeah. Um, and you're the co-founders of this Imago Relationship International, which has trained thousands of therapists at this point all over the world. So it's great to have you here. You've got a new book out, Doing Imago Relationship Therapy in in the Space Between, a Clinician's Guide, which just came out in April. And now that's a number one new release on Amazon. I'm, I'm interested if, if you want to share with us about that. What's what's that book all about? Well, I, uh, thank you, Keith. I would uh, we'd love to talk about that. And um, since it's a 450-page book, I, <laughs> <laughs> how much time do you have? <laughs> how much time do I have? <laughs> and uh, so I, I'll uh, I'll just give you uh, what we tried to do in the book, and then uh, hopefully people will go to Amazon. And thanks for mentioning that it's there and that it's doing really well. I think it's the top of the psychotherapy and clinical psychology list right now. Congrats. Well, basically, the uh, the uh, term space between is the defining uh, term for this clinical book. Because what that signals is mine and Helen's culmination of a process that began long ago of thinking, as you said in your introduction, differently about couples. And that what what evolved for us is that the uh, the relationship that couples have with each other, which we define as how they interact with each other, is what determines the quality of their internal experience as well as the quality of their relationship. So that we sort of moved from starting on the inside of people and working with their subjectivity to regulate anxiety and other issues and past traumas and then be able to function better. We start with the outside and help people function better in their interactions with each other in order to regulate all that inside stuff. So it sort of turned the therapeutic process on its head. So the book basically takes the space between <clears throat> and redefines uh, basically the field of therapy itself. And uh, obviously, it, uh, couples therapy is a subset of the field of therapy that so applies to that. And so 450-page elaboration of what Imago relationship therapy for couples is and elaborates the point I just made. So I could add two similar Please. Yeah. So, uh, when Harv and I were dating 40 years ago, all right, 45 okay. years ago, both of us had read the Tao of Physics, which had just come out, uh, Quantum Physics for the Layperson, first book. So mm -hmm. we've been talking quantum for 46 years. <laughs> yeah. And so it was so thrilling to get to write a book on that. And the other thing I would mention, I had been reading Martin Buber. And uh, the I Thou, uh, a Jewish mystic, and he said, people treat each other like an I It. Uh, they should consider treating each other like an I Thou. Right. And when that happens, universal energies of love begins to flow through the space between. And Harwell said, Helen, let's get that into the theory yeah. that that's what makes couplehood a mm. success. Safety in the space between. Yeah. Yeah. And I just want to underline what Helen just said that Helen actually brought the space between concept from Martin Buber into conversation with us, which eventually located it in that. Mm -hmm. And also, uh, we were, as you said, uh, many, many years ago, conversants about uh, quantum, uh, about quantum. And in this book, we've taken quantum field theory and replace Newtonian atomism with quantum field theory as the science within which the human experience is grounded and therefore within which the relationship is grounded. Wow. So Helen is not only, Helen is also, it may be, you know, and dialogue is our therapeutic 
process. And uh, it was also, um, gosh, Helen, about 40 something years ago when we were having one of our first fights, which was on our first or second date, uh, that Helen introduced the dialogue concept in that became now the therapeutic intervention for Imago by saying in the middle of our fight, hey, why don't we stop and one of us talk and the other one listen. Well, you maybe you it. start. You start listening. No, I don't know. Yeah. Maybe how, I don't know how it went down. I, 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 think, I think she did, and you start listening. <laughs> but I'll any, do it after you. We'll take turns. <laughs> that's that, that. That's just that, and that's something I want to talk about a little bit later as we as we get to it. Just how hard it is to do this work, even if you even even if you've written these books, wonderful books about it. I love that you've that you're speaking about this the 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 duality of of matter. It sounds like you're talking about some of these concepts that so many other fields, biology, of course, physics and the study of energy has already been doing. And now we're weaving it into psychology and consciousness yes. and, and our work directly, which is wonderful. We do this outside work so that we can go in and we go in perhaps so that we go out. Exactly. It's this wonderful right. dance. Right. It becomes an oscillation uh, and that all of life is a polarity. Yeah, I think the um, the particle and wave duality that showed up in the studies of Einstein uh, with the study of light is that light is both a packet and a and a wave, and which is particle, just mind blowing. Mind blowing, no, and nobody really understands that, but right. it is a fact. Right. And therefore, we have to take it into that it belongs to all of nature. There's this polarity and this oscillation between the poles, and here and, it is showing up. You know, it shows up between two people. I talked with jo uh, Jonathan Schooler, who you may know at, at UC Santa Barbara just a couple of weeks ago, and he's an expert on consciousness, and he's talking about this resonance theory yes. of, of consciousness, that everything's vibrating, everything's moving, and that's perhaps at a very small level how things organize. And, and sure enough, it shows up in how we organize, how we connect to one another, even through the electrons on our screen here. We're able to move with a, some sort of sync with each other. Um, yep. You know, I, so I, I want to get to Love Under um, Love Under Repair, which is my book about your book, <laughs> basically. I mean, you're at that point in your career and in our field where people have written about you many, many times. Oh. And I, I'm honored to say that I was one of those people. Um, but my book was about how to save your marriage and survive couples therapy because I wanted to give people a sense, kind of a consumer's guide. There's a lot of stuff out there. And Imago, of course, has become a, a strong voice for helping couples stay together. Um, you know, I wanted to help people decide, well, how is it distinct? How is the Imago paradigm distinct from perhaps the Gottmans or uh, EFT, Sue Johnson? And there, we could go on. We could talk about Stan Tacken. There's wonderful people that, are, that you've collaborated with uh, and that you well know over the years. How is Imago distinct? How would you say it's distinct from the other ways people can get help perhaps out there? I would say it's distinct in that Harvel has a capacity to simplify the complex in a way that I haven't seen anybody else do in the world that talks about relationships. Relationships are, it's a murky subject. And um, I just, um, at the beginning of any training or workshop or anything, we summarize the whole problem and solution, we say at the beginning, hey, we're going to first show you a new definition of a relationship. People think relationship is two people going through life. We think we define relationship as two people in the space between them. The physics of the between is if there's safety, people connect. If there's anxiety, people disconnect. Mm -hmm. And anyone can restore safety with four practices. And then we list the four pieces. And like, oh, mm. that's that. it is just amazing that he mm. can do that. And let me just say one more thing. Yeah. I love, Keith, you were talking about the duality of nature. Another of my favorite um, uh, statements of Harville is incompatibility is the grounds for marriage. Like, that's who you're going to fall in love with. A couplehood is a, an instance of nature. Mm -hmm. So is uh, the 
temperature, hot, cold. So mm. are how things feel, wet or dry. These opposites that, that, that seem to be struggles, right? The d- dark yeah. light. And so you, you finally fall in love. You say, I do. You get married. Mm. And you go, you and I are one. But you're thinking, I'm the one. Okay, yes. You meet my needs. So you yes. be an it. That's the little secret. That's the dirty secret. As long as you meet my needs, then we're good. All you need to do is read this book. Yes. Oh, you're speaking my language, Helen. That's, you know. Mm. Yeah, could I add one thing to what Helen is saying? At yeah. the clinical level, the difference is that um, we take couples who side by side and turn them to face each other. Mm-hmm. And then we say, you all talk to each other and I'll help you have that conversation. It's called the dialogue process. Mm-hmm. Most uh, couples therapists have the couples facing, sort of sitting the and therapist. Face, yeah. facing the therapist and the therapist interacts with the individual. They have the wisdom, the and therapist. That, and that shift is what, uh, in the dialogue process itself is our only intervention. Mm-hmm. So in that sense, it is distinct from just having couples talk in a free way. So yeah. I think yeah. that uh, Helen and those two things would probably make it distinct. That's wonderful. And it, yeah, it really is a discipline. And, and I think you would call it, you have called it a spiritual path. It really is. It's something yeah. that some people experience at first as a little restrictive, like, oh my goodness. Uh, you, you mean I have to, we have to take turns and we have to, see, I have to ask you if you're actually uh, interested in listening? <laughs> yes. <laughs> what, yes. What a radical right. idea. <laughs> right. Yeah. And that's it. And it's interesting and important that you say that structure creates safety, which makes it possible to experience connecting and intimacy. So without structure, how does that work for you? As Dr. Phil would say, you just run into each other. Mm. But with structure, you then can do this oscillation. It seems like a long time ago. Was it 1988 that Getting the Love You Want came out? Yes. Right. Yeah, it, it seems like a long time ago, but but you've had a long string of other books, Keeping the Love You Find. I just want to mention for people that, th- that you have this tremendous resource, a library, really, of your own literature. And of course, people have written about you like I have, but uh, Receiving Love was another book, Keeping, sorry, Giving the Love That Heals, um, which is about parenting. Yes. Right. Right. Yeah, that book was, um, we, we felt that since we had located the problematic for couples in their childhood issues, that it would be important to write a book for couples about parenting with the possibility that we might not produce so many people with those early life traumas that produce such difficult marriages. Uh, I want to go back to something you said earlier, Keith, that Oprah made Harville and the book famous. And I just want you to know, Harville was so mad watching the Emmy Committee Award thing, and she got the first Emmy, and he went, I won Oprah her first Emmy. (laughs) I should be up there. (laughs) So Harville, well, Oprah made Harville and the book famous. We made Oprah famous. That's how we did it. Totally, of course. (laughs) And and I'm sure if she were here, she would be telling that story, and it would be very interesting. Yeah, I'm just saying, I hope she does not listen to this podcast because she <laughs> might, be, might be offended by this, but we would hug about it. We, That's great. We, we helped each other in those early years. But what a wonderful person she is, if we can just say for a second. Um, I, her name came up in another show that I did, and uh, we, we made the same joke, you know, if she's listening out there. Um, oh. <laughs> you know, but we were talking about the Enneagram, and I came up, I, I never really did the Enneagram myself all these years in psychology. I just really never put much stock. I know everybody talks about it, like there's this currency and language they use. So I finally had some guy come on, and we talked about the Enneagram. Turns out I'm a three, mm-hmm. for, for what that's worth for people who are familiar with it, and Oprah is a three and that's been well known and but she's you know a very lovely version of that and has done work on her on her performance at the three is a performer you know the three i'd like to think i have too done some work on that i'm a lovely uh, three by the way um, we, we're doing the enneagram now oh, yeah. i've been wanting to do it for well we we brought it our kids brought it for the other kids to learn each other yes. better and we kept the grandkids so we never did ours and uh mm-hmm. I am, uh, and I said, look, I don't know what my Enneagram number is. And someone told me, I think I'm a seven, either six or seven, they was sort of the introverted visionary. Mm. Mm. And who, um, anyway, and uh, we finally sat down and we're trying to figure out Harvels this past two weeks. It can be really helpful. It's so um, interesting. It's a little window into the soul, I think, and 
these aspects. It's another mirror, right, uh, uh, about who we are. Yeah. And I think you'll appreciate the, the guest that I had, Michael Goldberg. He's writing a book right now about the Enneagram. He's an, he's an expert on Enneagram, but he's writing a book about the story of Jacob as well. Except two separate stories. He's talking about uh, Medusa and the Greek mythology, but yeah. also the story of Jacob. And Jacob was a three and he was a, he was a real asshole, right? I mean, you know, in, <laughs> in the Bible, if we can say that about biblical figures, I think we can. Um, yeah. You know, it, but, you know, the, he wrestled with the angel and then he, you know, there's this transformation that he, so he, he evolved out of that three. Um, so I guess yeah. that's what it's about for us yeah, evolving. About, yeah. Evolving Richard Rohr's book and there's Adele Calhoun. She and her husband wrote one for couples from a Christian perspective. Mm. That's fascinating. Uh, it's, it's, so I'm just dipping my toe in that. I'm glad you, you are as well. Um, you, you've spoken, well, let me, let me ask you about, um, I want to read a quote for making, from making marriage simple, one of your books. Uh, and this is, I think, this is kind of a mind bending thing. Do you want to be right or do you want to be in a relationship? And, and that's the quote. That's it. That's, do you want to be right or do you want to be in a relationship? Like you're kind of saying, which one do you want, buddy? <laughs> because you can't always have both. You right. can't cuddle up and relax with being right after a long day. Yeah. Why do right. we have such a hard time letting go of being right? Well, uh, first of all, that book is uh, is a prize book of ours, and Helen took the lead on that book. So, well, she put my name well, on, the, on the so front. Yeah, the I front comment holder. about it. I was worried some people might not make it through getting the love you want. I was thinking about the truck drivers, yeah. but also CEOs that are sure. too big. Said, could we take the content yeah. of getting and put cartoons and make it a simple read? Mm -hmm. And so that's what that book is. Making yeah. marriage simple. Making marriage, making marriage simple, uh, but uh, we didn't say make it funny. We didn't say making marriage easy. Mm. We just said making marriage simple. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Those are radically different he, things. He always comes in with the byline <laughs> that we didn't put That's on the good. Side. Yes. So, um, so, so the question is, why is it so hard uh, to be to be in relationship? And and also to have your have yourself, and I think I think there is, in a sense, a paradoxical choice that when you choose the relationship, you choose the context within which you live, which therefore you choose yourself. But if you choose yourself, then you're leaving out the context in which you live, and therefore you do not thrive unless you live in a thriving context. So when I choose our relationship. I'm in that oscillation. But if I decide I want to be right and be an individual and be autonomous and be right, then I make Helen into an it. And therefore, she is either a problem for me or a resource for me. And that never works uh, because it gets into transactional, to tactics, to trade-offs, uh, keeping score and all, all yeah. the, like that. So, and also a uh, being right I'm, I'm actually, we're working on a new book now called Getting More of the Love You Want. And we're going to, and this book is about the third stage in relationship, which is romantic love, power struggle, and real love, which we've not written a book about. We've written a book about how to get out of the power struggle, but we haven't written, and all the books are about basically getting out of the power struggle. And we talked about where you go with that, but not what it really looks like in, in a great hmm. thing. And the problematic that makes it difficult is that this is a tragic thing to say. All of us suffer, in some sense, a childhood trauma. It, it is a little trauma or big trauma. It was a scale of one to ten, we were traumatized soon after birth by the quality of the interaction with our caretaker. And that did something to us as a species. Namely, it scared us. So we became self-absorbed in our survival. And when you become self-absorbed, you don't take in a much data. You build a world inside your head, and then you, but you assume it's like the world outside, and it's not. So when you say, hey, it's cold in here, you assume other people are experiencing cold, and they're not. They're experiencing hot. And so you can say, well, no, it's cold in here. Well, no, I'm not cold. Well, it's cold in here. There's something wrong with you. Mm -hmm. Oh, I want to be right. Then you have to surrender yourself and your experience for me. And uh, that's, um, the, that's the polarization that leads down the path to 
all the problems of human problems between everybody and between partners. But if I decide I'm going to move into the relationship, then I'll say, well, okay, well, tell me about hot. So then mm. help will say, well, hot is, or, you know, this, this coffee tastes. Oh, so that's your world. So her, now her subjective experience. Right. And now we're differentiating my inner, my world from her world, but we're not polarizing about it. We're saying, hey, there are two worlds here. Mm. And if I honor her world, she honors my world. We live great. If I want her to make her world go away, then we're not going to live so great mm. uh, because she's not going. She's not going to react to that with compliance. Mm-hmm. Or if she does, they'll, she'll still be angry inside. So she'll either rebel and be angry, or be compliant and angry. But and, we, and, won't, but we won't connect. And to your point earlier, you mentioned safety. That that seems to be such an important need that we have as humans. That when when we can find some resource, whether it's a spiritual resource or um, a resource like yours, I think provides this guidepost that says, "Hey, it's safe. You can you can try this. You can you can open up yourself. You can open up curiosity." Right. You can open that up. seems to unlock the door. The curiosity unlocks the door, and when you hear then the other side, you mustn't say, "Well, that's not right." You have to hear it and validate it, honor it, affirm it, and that's what you have. So that's choosing the relationship which is we're both right and we're both wrong. Mm. Because none, nobody can have the whole truth. Right. I can only have a little piece of it. You can only have a little piece of it. So if we share each other's truth, we get two pieces. And it's but, like a bigger mind. It's like a, a transcendent way of thinking of it. It's a transcendent way of thinking about it. You know, I've written about being a marriage expert and having struggles in my relationship. I know how the humbling that is. Fortunately, <laughs> the, the younger generations of readers prefer to hear the experts talk about all their problems, if you've noticed that. <laughs> it's like, you're not really a real person unless you just wear it outside and kind of talk about it. So I, I guess fortunately now for those of us who actually do have human struggles, um, like I know you've spoken about this in your relationship, being an expert at love relationships and yet failing at it in some way. Do, do, are you able to speak to that, how humbling that is? Please take the time now to subscribe to The Soul of Life wherever you're listening. Give it a thumbs up or write a positive review. In our workshops, Harville would give me the permission to talk about the fact that when I proposed to him and he agreed to marry me, because I, I, my ex-husband sort of pushed himself. And it was an age where I was told women, women should do what men think. Uh. Yes. And uh, that was the wrong husband. Like, he was a businessman and da da da. And I was going to propose the next person. So when I proposed to Harville um, and said, move with me to New York and I'll help get the best publisher and the best da 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 and the best writer. And we're going to get the best manuscript. And five years later, the book came out. Well, now his wardrobe. It wasn't very good, and so <laughs> he needed a better wardrobe. And so I just committed myself to improve him. Mm. But I was always telling him what he could do better. Mm. <laughs> and he was miserable in our life. So for the last 12 years, I've been wondering about Harville instead of judging him. I am so happy that I stopped <laughs> trying to improve Harville. Right. Yeah. I mean, and he's got a great wardrobe, by the way. <laughs> I do have a great wardrobe. And, and, and Helen is, uh, is absolutely essential for all of Imago, but, but other including people, me. Other people yes. can yes. tell Harville if he needs a sure. better sure. I'm not going to do it. Yeah, I'm well, just going to enjoy him. Well, yeah. what, what's so striking, you know, like, because I, we, we, can, we can share this humor about it. And, and yet I know people are listening to this. And they, they know in their own life how heavy it can be, how heavy it can be to carry around this project around. And this is really what we do, right? We carry around this huge project of I've got to make you into something better. Yeah. Uh-huh. It's yeah. depressing, actually. I, I'll speak for myself. I, I got depressed. And, and that's, my, that's my gateway. It's the bowling alley right down the gutter for me. <laughs> so, right. But when you give up that project, you give up a huge burden in your life. Yeah. Because yeah. the other per the welfare the welfare of the other person. And if mm. you had fun. We so what 
saved our marriage included getting Groucho Marx at night, Groucho Marx glasses. We really? would put them on the night before going to bed, rims, big nose, mustache. We had joke books. And that was the time I used to tell Harville how he could improve because yes. the kids were in bed and I had his undivided attention. <laughs> and instead, we tell jokes right. and we give each other three appreciations. Mm-hmm. Put fun into your life, into yeah. your marriage and into your life. Yeah. It's a great message for people out there. Did you, did you want to say anything else about that, Harville? What, what that experience was like for you as a public figure having this humbling experience in your marriage? Oh, well, it, uh, well, it was humbling. Um, <laughs> and, um, and given that my low self-esteem, it was uh, somewhat shaming initially too. Uh, but it was also liberating to not have to be inauthentic. Mm. Uh, to be in the public and to have and and to say one thing like Helen was just saying, then go off the public and know that we just had a horrible fight before mm. we went out or before we or soon after we after we left. So it's it, it's okay to I think um, that that the liberation is that I'm, I'm a human after all. You're human, yeah. And and I'm a left brain person, so I can make up stuff, but uh, I don't have to practice it. But what I learned, which is what Helen, I think, is saying, is what we made up, actually, if you practice, it will change you. Mm. So both of us have been through that and are going through it and continue to go through every day that that process. And I think mm. just to top off what you were just saying, Helen, I, this morning I was thinking about this, the book I'm writing. And for some reason, I got to thinking about, well, I, keep, I think all the time, Keith, about what are we really, us human beings? Mm. You know, we all want something. And what do we want to do? And it was interesting. I was walking down the hallway and it just dropped into my mind. Our deepest desire is to play. Mm. Mm. And, and I thought, mm. I, and I, I started to look up and said, where did that come from? Um, our deepest, but you just said it. It's, but in a, in, you know, in a, yeah, in a more verbal way. It, well, I've but, never yeah. said it before because we'd make it more, more sophisticated, like our deepest desire is to connect, our deepest desire is to love. But if you look at the still face um, uh, experience that, mm. that was um, done at Harvard by Dr. Uh, Ed, Ed, Ed Tronic. Ed Tronic. Yeah. When you look at that baby, and then, you know, in the first uh, the minute of that exercise, you, you're familiar with that, the way you're shaking. Yeah. It. It's hard it's, to watch. It, it's hard to watch. It's hard to watch the second minute. But the first minute, what this mother and baby are doing is playing. And when the mother ruptures that play, of course, she ruptures connection. But what the baby wants is to play. So the baby yeah. tries to get the mother to play again. And when the mother comes back and starts playing, so it just dawned on me that our deepest desire as human beings is to play because what that means is I'm safe. Mm. I'm with somebody with whom I have this resonance going on. That is the mm. ultimate human experience. Mm. And I'm going to start talking about that in publicly. Okay. Now, what you really want to do and the life you really want to live is one in which you can play mm-hmm. with another person. And that means you feel safe with that person. And I do share mm-hmm. with with our audiences that a neural pathway can't be having fun and it can't be anxious at the same time. Well done. Yeah, you guys nailed it. You really have summed up a, a great body of, of research and emerging work about how playfulness and joy is is this almost magic. It's the magic of who we are. Yes, um, it's the magic of who we are. It's, it's the essence. And yet when we go after it, when we try to get it, uh, we can't get it because all that stress, the energy of going after the hunt, uh, yeah. you know, pushes it away. Well, and, yeah. We did something that transformed our relationship. Think of it every day as part of a calendar. The first of the month, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth. Okay, on the odd days of the month, it's my job to make sure we go to bed connected. Hmm. And on the first, the third, the fifth, the seventh, the ninth. On the even days of the month, it's your job. If, If for any reason we have a little rupture or whatever, you have to make sure we're connected and yep. feeling great when we go to bed, whatever it takes. Mm-hmm. Now, the next day, it'll be my day to yep. be on duty. I do want to point this out that Helen has the 
odd day. You're saying she's a little odd? She's, she's the odd day, and I'm the I'm even. Normal. I'm the even day, so <laughs> Helen is odd, and I'm even. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Perfectly normal. I'm normal. <laughs> well, you guys will have to duke that one out <laughs> another time. <laughs> um, and that brings me to my, to my last uh, question for you. I was at your ranch probably in maybe 2002 or three, around that time for a training. It was lovely Sophie Slade. Um, who else was there? Wendy Patterson, Rod uh, Katitsky. Rod was there, and so and I remember. And lovely, it was such a you were such wonderful hosts, and you were teaching all week, and I was able to be there. And uh, there was a there's a painting of us uh, of a very unique Star Trek uh, <laughs> group of people. Uh, can you describe that for people? Um, <laughs> well, well, uh, I'm I'm having a, a the, the the major thing. What what was the topic of the painting? Yeah. Yeah, because it had the Star Trek. I was trying to remember if it was the Last Supper or. I, yeah, it was. It was. I think it was a spiritual image of some yeah, kind. Like, I was just really impressed by that level. It was very large. That's why right. it was. It was a Last Supper image, mm-hmm. and there was uh, two of the captains of Star Trek painted on the sides of that. Because <laughs> uh, I am a Star Trek devotee. I think that, and more than Star Wars. Star Wars is like mm-hmm. Western. Uh, and they're fun, but Star Trek is an intellectual, artistic uh, tradition. And and Doctor and uh, Pat, uh, Patrick Stewart, uh, <clears throat> who is um, uh, the the captain of that, is 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 my hero. By the way, Helen's Helen Feneg. <laughs> that's me- Helen. That's Helen Genuflex for people who are not seeing the video. <laughs> God and Patrick Stewart, like yes. right up there. And Helen, uh, when we were in New York, now many years ago, he was there. Doing the Christmas Carol was a the you know so one man Christmas Carol. Oh, and yeah. Helen on Broadway on Broadway, and Helen figured out. Oh, uh, and what we're going to is a very complicated, interesting story. But figured out how to get an interview with him and behind stage. Not an interview, but just to show up just, and just, have oh, wow. meet, to meet him. Just, wow. just the, the, what is it? Was that a surprise? Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, it was. It was a surprise was for me. But uh, here's wow. the real surprise. When he walked out, we waited 30 minutes for him to get dressed and walk out. When he walked out, he walked directly to me. All these other people were waiting for him to sign their, you know, give the autograph. Mm-hmm. And he reached and he out saw his Harvard. And he reached out his hand and he said, Dr. Hendricks, I am so pleased to meet you. Mm. And I said I to him, have- I'm here to meet you. <laughs> <laughs> Captain Picard, what is going on? And he says, your book is on my bedside table. Oh, my goodness. I am halfway through it, and I am thoroughly intrigued. <laughs> Thank you. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Said, well, was, this is this was, is a reversal. Uh, so so we met and, and over mutual admiration at the time. So that, that embedded him into my heart even, even more. more. But you had a That's question wonderful. about this a little bit beyond. Yeah, I, I, well, I'm, you know, we can, that, this leads me to sort of this very broad, vast uh, topic of cosmology. But, um, you know, what are your insights? You, because you are writing about quantum physics and field theory in your book, and you're, you've been speaking about this for years, yeah. about the deep connection that we have to all of nature and the universe. And do you see that as a spiritual practice? Um, some of this research that's coming out, does that move you spiritually like it does me? The thing that I've worked with in my own mind uh, with some real resistance for a long time is how far does consciousness go? And that question of is consciousness a brain derivative or is the brain a derivative of consciousness? Right. Finally, one day I folded and I said, consciousness is not the hard problem of physics. Consciousness is the easy problem. The brain is the hard problem. Yeah. Yeah. Consciousness is what is. Consciousness is foundational. Every quanta, which is the smallest conceivable unit of energy, is awareness. Yes. Awareness constant. Fundamental. Everything is fundamental. So we could assume that. And I think now, which is I have not actually read anywhere, so I'm really going out on a limb. I think the universe, I'm not the universe. The universe is a derivative of, of, the, of the quantum field. And of consciousness. But, the, but consciousness is, is, 
is reality. The right. capital R. Everything that is uh, everything that is comes out of consciousness. Mm -hmm. And therefore, um, uh, we would have to say consciousness is in everything. Everything is of consciousness and that our consciousness is a point in a conscious universe in which the universe becomes conscious of itself and it can reflect on itself. Somehow, the universe evolved a brain so the, so the universe could come to know itself. Right. Whoa, that, that, whoa, I mean, we have to, we have to slow that down right there because, whoa, <laughs> right? I mean, I mean, some of these things, um, they re, like you said earlier, um, even the, the smartest people on this earth, I was talking to John Mather. He's, he's the head of the, uh, the James Webb Space S Telescope, which is launching oh, in the, in the fall. And, yeah, uh, and yeah. I, I spoke with him. He's a Nobel laureate and, and he, he discovered cosmic background, microwave, microwave background. Oh, yeah, that, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's John, that's John, Dr. Mather. And, you know, some of the smartest people in the world, uh, ha ha spend their lives on that sent on a sentence like that on, on these fundamental questions and yes. like, wow, unpacking this, it can sound for some people a little bit heady. I think when we talk about this, um, I'll end on this thought. I'm, I'm, I'm reading a book called the, the wild edge of sorrow, the um, wild edge of sorrow, the wild edge oh. of sorrow by Weller. Uh, I can't remember the first name, but it reminds me of, because it talks about a sacred approach to grief mm -hmm. and that when we approach grief as though it's something to get done, boy, does it bite us. Um, you mm -hmm. know, similar to the, these ideas of, of storms or I suppose black holes in the universe, when we approach them as scary objects, as if they're trying to take something from us, boy, we, we, we will get sucked into it and we will become the black hole. And, and yet when we approach these objects, whether they're massive in the universe that we're beginning to see with these telescopes or perhaps something in our own heart that feels massive and hard, when we approach it with this wonder, this word that Helen used earlier, boy, does it begin to, it begins to dance. Yeah. It and, almost and begins if, to dance. And if you take that in one step further, that the uh, consciousness reality is an organism. Hmm. <clears throat> and we've already said it's a conscious. So it's in some sense, quote, living. Right. Organism is itself evolving. And its fundamental feature is creativity because it gives birth to billions and billions of galaxies, yes. stars. So, And our creativity is a function of that and an expression of that. So this organism itself is evolving. And as it evolves, we experience its own evolution into new understandings of itself. And I think quantum field theory is the last, I mean, it's the most recent uh, point of self-awareness of the universe of itself. And that the universe itself has become aware that it is an interconnected whole. And it's, it's therefore, marvelous. it's now being transmitted to us and, and then through us to everyone else to say, when we can all get on that train, mm. we are a part of an organism Mm. It is alive and that is functioning, that is evolving and it's creative. Then we relate to each other differently because you become in some sense astonishingly wondrous that yes. you're a part of a conscious evolving uh, organism like I am. And we are cells in that body and we need to take care of each other or mm. we'll become a cancer in the body. And deeply, you it's deeply moving to me to... Yeah. to um, you know, mess around with these to mess topics. around, and I know that's messing around with it. And I hope no quantum physicists are listening. <laughs> <laughs> well, if they are, they'll let us know, and we invite that because yeah. we would love to talk to more people about this subject and bring more people into the conversation. Harville uh, Hendricks and Helen LaKelly Hunt, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Keith Miller. Hey, I've started a community for Soul of Life fans interested in talking about episodes or getting more information about some of my teaching on IFS, mindfulness, and relationship growth. Head on over to community.souloflifeshow to get access to this group of really cool people just like you who care about the show and want to talk about episodes or, or hear more, or get access to courses, and, and support each other through life. That's what this is all about. Please leave an iTunes rating for the show and subscribe now wherever you listen to get more soul in your life. I like it and it's not harsh to my eardrum.
All right, I will go.